Hi, I'm Sonny Baglin, interventional radiologist in Northern Virginia at Vascular Interventional Partners of Northern Virginia. And I'm Jason Levy, interventional radiologist in Atlanta, Georgia at Northside Atlanta, Forsyth and Cherokee Hospitals. And we're gonna be discussing the results from the Opus One clinical study on the first 100 patients enrolled in the radiofrequency ablation study to treat painful osteolytic bone metastases. The Opus One investigators decided to investigate radiofrequency ablation for musculoskeletal metastases, in part because we knew that it was an underutilized therapy. So despite the fact that it is mentioned both in the NCCN guidelines in an algorithm for the spine, as well as an option uh, outside of the spine, its utilization in, in this country is very, very low, especially when you compare it to external beam radiation. The study was designed with a primary endpoint of worst pain at a three month time point. However, we investigated and evaluated patients at a three day, one week, one month, three month, six month, and 12 month time point. And the investigation included average pain, worst pain in the last 24 hours, disability scores. We did look at opiate use as well, and uh, things like mood scores and uh, pain interference, meaning how pain affects your quality of life. Yeah, I would, I would add to that too. <clears throat> it's a great summary, Jason. And I think that be, this study being a post-market study, utilize the osteocool device, which is already FDA approved for the use of, like Jason mentioned, osteolytic bone metastases. Um, and so we were treating lesions that were in the thoracolumbar spine and then also in the peripheral bone as well, uh, just excluding the cervical spine. So it really included a large cohort of patients like Jason mentioned, uh, but in multiple locations as well. So in these uh, first 100 patients, roughly 50-50 were male and female, uh, worked out to be 56% uh, female and 44% male. And the average age was about 65, which is what you'd expect for a metastatic bone tumor uh, clinical study. And the most common primary sites of tumor that had been spread to the bone involved the lung, breast, and then the kidney as well. So um, the other unique characteristic of this study uh, compared to other clinical studies on ablation is the amount of patients that had undergone previous radiation. So radiation can be a confounding variable for many uh, reasons, uh, most, most uh, partic particularly because it could confound the interpretation of whether or not pain relief is related to the ablation procedure or to uh, radiation itself. And in this clinical study, 95% of patients had no previous uh, radiation at their baseline visit uh, for us. Agreed, that's a, a, a great uh, way to summarize that. The only thing I would add is that in addition to the fact that those patients were radiation naive, it's actually even more surprising because the vast majority of these patients were very late stage in their cancer treatment. So they, despite that, still had not seen radiation. So one of the great things was that at each and every data point, the pain, quality of life, functionality, mood scores improved at every single time point, including the three-day time point. So one of the things about the current standard of care with external beam radiation or SBRT is the time to pain relief is, is not insignificantly long. It can be anywhere from three to four weeks up to eight to nine weeks. So these patients were seeing significant pain reductions, significant improvement in quality of life and functionality scores at three days. One of the other things that we noticed in the study was there was a decrease in opioid use in uh, approximately 48% of the patients uh, using opioid, which is actually even more impressive when you take into account the fact that these patients were again at end stage, right? So th these were not patients early in their, their uh, uh, disease. The improvement in terms of the rapidity is important because these patients normally have to sustain pain for a number of weeks in the standard of care therapies like radiation, for example. Uh, but this allowed patients to really get a rapid improvement. I really just completely echo exactly what Jason said. You know, the, the key about opioid reduction also can't be uh, underemphasized as well, because 
many of these patients who require even IV medication who might be at home hospice therapy uh, or admitted to a hospital on intravenous therapy, now if they're able to reduce their medication, they can actually recover at home. And I think that's a, an important quality of life measure that is often difficult to measure uh, and present on, but it's a reality of the clinical study that we, we just found. At baseline, the pain, average pain score at the sites uh, that were treated uh, for, the, for the subjects was over eight points on a scale of zero to 10. It was roughly 8.2 points. And so at, uh, on a scale of zero to 10, with 10 being the most severe pain and zero being no pain as reported by the patient, they reported that average of say 8.2 points. Um, immediately after the procedure, uh, and this is from three days, one week, one month, and three and six months, pain reduced to, from that 8.2 to 5.6, 4.7, 3.9, 3.7, and then 3.5. So as Dr. Levy mentioned earlier, each and every time point did that pain improve. And you know, me, when you measure pain, what's important is you want to see at least a two-point improvement in, in subjective pain reporting. And that pain improvement was immediately even from 8.2 to 5.6, very rapid in, in these patients. And that's what's important. Um, and it was durable, even out to six months. And like Dr. Levy mentioned earlier, given that you're treating patients who are stage four patients and they are near end of life, there's a very high attrition rate. And that's to be expected in a stage four cancer study. And in this time point, even at six months, uh, to have good follow-up is very critical. I think, number one, I think this study is not dissimilar to other studies other than the, the fact that, uh, that we had more patients, so it's the largest prospective study ever, um, and that we had such a radiation-naive component. So I think this really just adds to the evidence and, and really probably gives us our best level of evidence right now that radiofrequency ablation works. I think that with RFA in particular, you've hit a good middle ground of how to target a lesion, particularly in the spine, uh, and like Jason mentioned, in the pelvis. Um, the other modalities, if you were to compare standard care modalities in terms of ablation, like microwave or cryoablation, or even IRE, uh, don't necessarily perform in bone or in the spine in, I think, what I would consider, or Jason might consider, uh, the most desirable fashion. And by that, I mean certain modalities, for example, cryoablation may not allow you to see the ice ball within the bony structures as well and could put what we're all concerned about in spine ablation or bone ablation is nerve injury. And it can put those nerves at particular risk because you can't necessarily identify the extent of your ice ball as you would say in a renal ablation. Um, in other, uh, when comparing other modalities, such as say microwave therapy, that energy may be, while effective in getting rapid uh, thermal energy to spread within tissue, it may be too rapid in the setting of the spine or even the pelvis when you're close to nerves. And so I think RFA is, has a particular uh, advantage in, in this area. There were uh, four adverse events uh, noted in this study uh, two of them required hospitalization, pneumonia and respiratory failure, which you might expect in, in this sort of elderly and sick population. Um, and none of the actual uh, events were directly related to the study device itself. Um, but there were, like Jason mentioned earlier, a number of deaths uh, that we saw in this cohort of patients out to six months. So 29 deaths in the uh, 100 patients that were studied out to six months which is an attrition rate that we would accept for stage four cancer patients. Well, you might accept a 20% attrition rate in, um, in uh, other clinical studies that don't involve cancer, for example, just because patients may be lost to follow-up. In this particular study, for example, we would expect um, that patients are going to unfortunately pass for other reasons um, in this setting. The fact that there was not a single neurologic complication in 100 patients, I mean, I think speaks to the safety of, frankly, this RFA device. And one of the things that we know that we can always enjoy is, especially in the spine, which is what 87% of these patients were, 
is that we get a straight posterior line that essentially matches the posterior wall of the vertebral body. Uh, and I think that would play a big role in why we did not see a single neurologic complication. We know that there was you know, pain improvement at every time point, functionality improvement, disability improvement. You know, we also know that patients minimized their opioid use. There was a low level of complications. So I think this was a, a, an extremely successful, as predicted, to be honest with you, successful uh, uh, study that will hopefully argue to you know, start following a little more of the NCCN guidelines, move it up in the chain. So rather than seeing patients who are so late in their stage, getting to these patients earlier so that we can treat their pain faster than the alternatives and in a safe manner. So for me, I think the, the highlight summary of the study and how it really will shape not just our practices, where we already incorporate this procedure uh, within our practice, but really shape the field of interventional radiology and oncology is that when you have a procedure such as this, which has such outstanding data in terms of, like Dr. Levy mentioned earlier, neurologic safety, low adverse event risk, and the ability to get a rapid pain relief, migrating this procedure from what was a procedure that was thought of as strictly at the end of the line, not a last ticket option for patients, and moving it up in the treatment algorithm, and allowing more patients to really have the availability of such a procedure so they can be palliated earlier on in their treatment algorithm. I think for me, that will allow many more patients to live a higher quality of life, lower pain uh, in their life that they have remaining, uh, with this stage four cancer. And I think that's the biggest impact this procedure will have uh, in the medical community in future. I think we should be using this earlier, okay? And, and part of that's because this can be consolidated with radiation. And there's some much smaller studies that show that those patients actually even do the best compared to, to one modality versus the other. And we can avoid the risks of radiation. So if this, if this is done first, then those risks of radiation of destabilizing the bone in, in a delayed skeletal event, namely a fracture, goes away. We've both gotten as good local tumor control as possible, and we've avoided uh, delayed skeletal events. So that, that would be my opinion. So RFA in the spine and peripheral bone really should be moved up in the treatment algorithm to offer patients, I think, earlier on when they're undergoing, say, systemic therapy, or in even combination with radiation therapy. And there are many reasons why. I mean, the first primary reason is uh, when it's moved up earlier in the treatment algorithm, patients can stay on their systemic therapy and may not need to stop their treatment, uh, their systemic treatment to get say three or four weeks of radiation therapy. Um, two, uh, when performed in conjunction with radiation therapy, um, it may allow patients to have a more durable result, which has been shown in clinical studies that were published overseas. Um, so I think having the ability to move a patient up and offer them this option earlier on uh, when they're first maybe diagnosed with metastatic disease, that may be uh, a better place for this procedure because patients may see a more durable outcome. And frankly, they may tolerate their treatments overall better.